Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. I got to tell you, our Delaney's uh, OK Turn Langley inbox is uh, hopping, popping, loading, not uh, not stopping. Hey, uh, by the way, before we get to and all of our guests today, including Thomas Durant standing by, uh, brought to you by our friends at Quinsome Communications uh, yeah. Group, who also sponsor. Is it just me? Do we have any update on Tyler Myers who left the no, game? No, we, we don't, uh, Donnie, uh, because Canucks have a day off today. And guess what uh, Tyler Myers agent J.P. Barry's doing these days? He's dealing with Elias Pettersson. He's, de- he's dealing with uh, El- Elias Pettersson in the contract. So he just ignores everybody else? Well, what do you think he's concerned about, a, uh, you know, which could be nothing? Am I, he's dealing right now with the Canucks on the Pedersen. Boy, sorry for asking the question. <coughs> well, I, 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 I would not get a return. So you're agree. saying JP's ignoring all of his other clients. That's no, he's what you're not. Saying. He's not ignoring. Hey, wow. right, right now we're ignoring Thomas Strand. That's a good point. From the which athletic. is not a bad thing to do. Okay, uh, Thomas joins us now. How are you, sir? Any update on, any update on, on Tyler Myers? Maybe you can help us. Yeah. It's a it's a team day off, and JP Barry is only negotiating with uh, Canucks <laughs> about Pedersen. He's literally doing nothing else. He's even yeah. stopped doing cartwheels, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he will be doing cartwheels after the Pedersen deal. Uh, Thomas, five one Kings over the Canucks. Was that as uh, poor a performance of, as you've seen from this team this season? Up there. It was, uh, it was, no, I don't think so. I think that was a pretty mid range game, to be honest with you. Uh, the, like, this, the, that wasn't as bad as the Seattle game from just yeah. like a week ago, right? Like, that was an uglier performance overall, uh, an even more punchless offensive performance. Uh, you know, generally speaking, I'm not particularly concerned with what we're seeing from the Canucks here. Uh, you know, one, five, and one's not pretty. Don't get me wrong over their last seven. Uh, sub 500 since the All-Star break, it's it's not great. But, you know, good teams do go through these stretches. I mean, we saw the Oilers start the season two, eight, and three. We saw the Kings have a, a big stumble in January. I mean, they were a 350 point percentage team in that month, uh, leading to the firing of Todd McClellan. And honestly, I think the Canucks have improved uh, over the course of the season. I know it feels like their form is listing, but their baseline today is much higher than it was, you know, e- even in October and November when they got off to hashtag the start and sort of announced themselves as a threat in the Pacific Division. Um, this team's five on five game has been formidable, even as, you know, the, the goal scoring's dried up, uh, the goaltending has kind of sagged uh, overall. And the special teams have really fallen apart. Like, I still think you're seeing reasons to believe that this team's, you know, n- not just trending in, in in a favorable direction, but but has a shot come playoff time. Uh, there's things to iron out. And, and I think on an individual basis, like if you were to tell me, if you were to tell me that you thought in that performance against the Kings, they look too light up front, too slow on the back end, and not playoff ready as a group, I'd say that's totally right. On, a, on the basis mm-hmm. of an individual game, like their performance mm-hmm. in, in one game. But when I zoom out and sort of look at the larger trend around this team, uh, you know, I see a lot of cause for, like I see more cause for optimism. Uh, far from reasons to be concerned, I see this as being more like when a really good team stumbles, like the Kings or the Oilers did earlier in the season. And when those things happen, I tend to be like, yeah, but, you know, that's just bounces, that's just you know, individual games, individual mistakes. Their baseline's so high that they're going to come out of it. I feel the same way about the Canucks right now. Ryan, do you have any idea when Thomas Dratz is going to join us? Who's this guy here? I can't believe you're Mr. Positive. Oh. Given what I, we, I follow, it, it, yeah, it, it, I follow it was, the data, though. Right? Like, uh, to, uh, I mean, I was watching the game. There, there was things I didn't like. I said that they weren't playoff ready. They looked mm-hmm. not playoff ready last night. That's pretty harsh criticism. But... That's one game. Like, I'm not the guy who overreacts to the result of one game. Right, Donnie? I, I'm I the guy am. who looks at large sample data and tries to, yeah. <laughs> I, I try to look at large sample data and large sample data. This team's, this team's better than I expected by a lot. 
Look, um, let's go. Let's I go away. Reached... From, let's go away from the yeah. data for a second. And we talked your life. You saw our first segment. I know you tune in regularly. But can the Canucks use fatigue as an excuse? Their February schedule, especially when you take into consideration. Uh, and I'm not making excuses. I'm just stating facts here. Their, their February schedule was tough, especially when you take into consideration that six of their best players were in Toronto for the for the All Star game. Yeah, and they use that as an excuse. I think so. I think so. I'm I'm generally pretty open mm. to the idea that 82 games of professional hockey is wild. Like the NHL season's too long by at least 22 games. Uh, it's so compressed. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's realistic to expect a team to be at the top end level uh, of the, like readiness all the time for, for 82 games. Uh, you know, 82 60-minute efforts is not possible uh, given the demands on these athletes, given just the limits of human performance. Uh, the Canucks have led the NHL in games played for most of the year. And, and if the narrative is with all the distractions, all the all-stars, all the compressed schedule, especially this month, really catching up to them, uh, that they were far from their best over the course of this month. I, I mean, I find that compelling. I, I, bu I buy that. And, you know, I, I especially buy that because, on, on again, in terms of their overall form as a team, you know, I, I think that's mostly held at even strength. I think it's fallen off in terms of execution. And that, to me, matches what I'd expect from a tired group. You know, like what I'm seeing the specific low energy levels that I, I've seen from the Canucks, especially like performances against Washington, even the win against Boston. Like I thought the Boston game was a low energy game for large stretches. Certainly the Pittsburgh game was. And so, you know, a lot of the ideas of what I'd expect this team to look like if they were fatigued, if they were feeling a little run down, I, I think matches what we're actually seeing from them on the ice. Thomas, what do you make of the Pedersen contract talks? Uh, the noise in the market got extremely, extremely loud, and then you had the Carolina offer. Where's this ending up? So, Rick, I, 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 instead of giving you an answer, I want to have a conversation with you because I think this one is one of the most difficult stories, negotiations to really pin down I agree. of my career. I agree. Um, you know, e even last night, even last night after the, you know, Friedman report on the Carolina Hurricanes, you know, asking around, like, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced, for example, that teams around the league that talked to the Canucks about this even really thought there was a chance they'd land the player, no, right? Like, no. I'm not convinced that rival clubs were convinced of the Canucks' seriousness. Yep. But that doesn't matter. What matters is how convinced was Pedersen of their seriousness. Uh, I, I think also, you know, at the center of this is a relatively enigmatic player who has played his cards close to the best, right? Like there is a key decision maker here who has not shared his feelings about why exactly this is playing out the way it is. Uh, as a result, I think a lot of people who are discussing this are, are doing so in a vacuum with, with a ton of uncertainty, um, you know, uh, depending on who I've talked to or, or in asking around, you know, I've had people that expect the deal to be done imminently. Uh, I've mm. had people that think it could be two weeks, another two months, like uh, th that it could still go on a while. Uh, I do think the Sarah Volley report, it was a heck of a scoop, um, you know, is fundamentally accurate in that progress has been made this week suddenly. Uh, I don't know exactly where or how it ends or when. And, mm. you know, this is sort of one of those stories that you cover and, and you, you need to approach it with a hearty dose of skepticism. Uh, I think the information flow has certainly been interrupted since the Saravali report. Um, obviously, it's a delicate stage in, in a crucial negotiation for the hockey club and for the player, a, a massive life decision. Uh, given all of that uncertainty, given, given all of that sort of, not conflicting, but, but certainly there's a lot of different sides to this. And, and I think it's hard to really pick through it and, and figure out what's true. Um, aside from the fact that suddenly this week progress was made and, and it does appear that, you know, s some level of hardball was played by the Canucks to try and stimulate talks. And, and apparently those efforts were successful. But they can't have reports on his uh, contract blown up every week. I mean, the noise got extremely. They talked to Pedersen. And one of the major reasons why was, hey, look, let's try to you know, nip this in the bud. 
you know, we're a team heading to the playoffs and we got something popping up weekly uh, about your contract. Let's try and get it done and nip it in the bud and move on. They can't have stories breaking about this and then concentrate on the playoffs while this is all going on. Well, I think there's been a pretty significant effort to try and limit distraction as much as possible, Rick. I mean, you even think about the Kuzmenko situation, which which sort of festered. And, and I think internally there there was a sense when they when they did deal him to Calgary that like, you know, now we can move on. Now Kuzmenko's ice time isn't a daily talking point on Donnie and Dolly. Now now Ryan Henderson won't be coming up with more mischievous poll questions uh, about Kuzmenko's usage. So, um, you know, I, I do think that that was part of what. Um, I do think that's been a priority for this club. And, you know, in terms of the noise, like if it's helped stimulate a resolution here, Rick, yes, it's, it's, there's a downside to it, but it also would, would seem in this case to have benefited the club, at least benefited their long-term interests. No, like I almost look at this and wonder, right? We know that Jim Rutherford's been around a while, right? We know that last year, the media narrative around this team got away from the club, especially in the wake of uh, LaFair, Bruce Boudreaux, right? Mm. I, I sort of wonder if Rutherford found a way to use that noise to stimulate negotiations with one of this team's most important players. Is that evidence of like a savvy veteran hockey executive figuring out how to turn a negative? the noise, the hot Canadian market side of, of managing a team in Vancouver uh, in his favor in this instance. That's sort of one thing that I'm wondering in the wake of how this week has played out. Outstanding as always. Thomas, thanks so much for this. Appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Be well.